And good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Okay, I hope you appreciated what I had to say yesterday morning in regard to the apostles' understanding and what Daniel said. You know, folks, this really is honestly a tremendous point. It's one that you really have to catch the power of it because once a person understands what Jesus was saying to his apostles about their generation and about Daniel and about Daniel's prophecy, it absolutely obliterates any argument, any claim about the apostles being so ignorant, not understanding the prophecies of the time of the end. I mean, after all, Daniel foretold the time of the end. Daniel foretold the appointed time of the end. And Jesus was telling his apostles, when you see that which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Well, Daniel foretold the appointed time of the end. So the apostles were going to see the appointed time of the end. See? It's incredible. Now then, I want to move on. Because, you see, I've been trying to make the connection for you and with you between Daniel chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. We've been camped on Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following for, for a good little bit. Now then, let's continue that connection, shall we? Daniel chapter 12, obviously, foretold the resurrection. Many of those who sleep in the dust shall arise. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. Now, let's not forget the efforts of some to say Daniel chapter 12 verse 1, talk about the days of Antiochus Epiphanes. Mr. Kyle Pope made that application, but then he jumped to verse 2 and said, Daniel chapter 12 verse 2, oh, that's the end of time. As if that has anything to do with the grammatical flow, the contextual flow of the text of Daniel chapter 12. Now, I can assure you this, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kyle Pope would object if he were in a conversation with a dispensationalist. And a dispensationalist were to say, well, <clears throat> you know, you have the, uh, we have the 69th week of Daniel chapter 9 bringing us right down to the baptism of Jesus. And Mr. Pope would almost undoubtedly, almost undoubtedly say, you're exactly right. But the dispensationalist would say, well, but wait a minute. God divinely inserted a, a gap of so far 2,000 years between the 69th and the 70th week. And Mr. Pope would almost undoubtedly go, whoa, 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 where in the world are you getting that idea? You don't get that from the text of Daniel chapter 9. Those weeks are connected. Well, amen. And yet, Kyle Pope comes to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And says, well, verse 1. We talk about the times of Antiochus Epiphanes in the 2nd century B.C., but verse 2 is talking about the end of time. So Kyle Pope inserts a gap of so far 2,000 or 2,200 years to roughly rough, to round it off between Daniel 12.1 and Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Where's the justification? If the dispensationalist is wrong, per Mr. Kyle Pope, to insert a 2,000-year gap between Daniel Daniel's 69th week and the 70th week, then where's the justification for inserting a 2,000, a 2,200 year gap between Daniel 12, 1 and Daniel chapter 12, verse 2? I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, the only way, reason in the world to do that is a priori, that is to say, presuppositional theology that says, well, you see, I know what the resurrection is. That's the raising of dead bodies out of the dirt. Since that didn't happen in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes of Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, then it must happen in our future 
And so I'm going to insert that 2,200-year gap between verse 1 and verse 2. But back on point, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 foretold the resurrection. Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following foretold the resurrection. Now, Daniel chapter 12 does not mention the coming of the Lord. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and following, does not specifically mention the resurrection of the dead. But you know what? I don't know very many people, not many people at all, that deny that although Daniel doesn't mention the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory to sit on the throne of his kingdom, and although Jesus doesn't speak of the resurrection of the just and the unjust, although you do have the righteous and the unrighteous, it doesn't mention their resurrection specifically. But I don't know very many people that would say, oh, well, you know what? Yeah, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. That's one event, Matthew 25, 31 and following, is a totally different event <coughs> of a totally different nature at a totally different time. Oh, no, no. People understand we are talking about the same events. And yet, you know what? Just this last week, as I make this video, one former preterist said, how do we know that how do we know that the preterists are wrong? Well, because they talk about the end of the Mosaic Age and the end of the Christian Age. Well, the Bible never uses the term end of the Christian Age, therefore the preterists are wrong. This is what you call a negative fallacy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to, you know, to express it another, another way, if it ain't there, it ain't there. They're saying if a specific given word, term, or phrase is not used, then a doctrine is not there, not there. And yet those same identical individuals conflate Daniel 12, 2, Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. Inconsistent? <laughs> oh, in the nth degree, argumentum ad desperatum, Undeniably so. But it's what people have to do to hold on to their futurism. Now then, so, Daniel chapter 12. <laughs> Pardon me. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, is the resurrection. Now notice Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, is the time of the end when the righteous would shine forth as the sun. As the sun. Then, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 6, one angel asked the other, When shall these things, what shall be the time of the end of these wonders? The other angel holds up his right hand to heaven and his left and swears by him who lives forever and forever that it shall be a for a time, times, and a half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be fulfilled. I was in a formal public debate in 1991 here in Ardmore, Oklahoma, and evidently my opponent had never read Daniel chapter 12, except he appealed to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, as proof of a yet future resurrection. That's what you call proof texting. You find a verse that seems to say what you want it to say, and you say, ah, see, there, there that proves it. So I had a chart, put it up on a great big screen, and I said, what my opponent has failed to do is to read the entire context. So I read Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. You have never seen such panic in all of your life at the table, at the man's table. You know, what, you know how he answered that? He didn't. He absolutely 100% ignored Daniel chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. At a follow-up debate, guess what? He ignored it. Until finally, after I pressed him several different times, he said, well, uh, how do I know that uh, Matthew chapter 24, 29 to 31, 
was fulfilled in the first century, it is because Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation will by no means pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. He said, that's how I know Matthew 24, 29 to 31 is fulfilled and not Daniel. Well, once again, argumentum ad desperatum. I went back to Daniel chapter 12 or 7. When the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all of these things shall be fulfilled. Now the point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that Daniel chapter 12 is predictive of the resurrection. It's predictive of the end of the age. It is predictive of the kingdom. Those are the constituent elements of Matthew 25, 31 and following. They are also the constituent elements of Matthew 24, 29 to 31 which my all-millennial and post-millennial friends say, oh, well, you know, Matthew 24, 29 to 31, that was all A.D. 70. So here is what my all-millennial and post-millennial friends do. They completely ignore Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. Completely ignore it. As if it did not exist. And do you know N.T. Wright does the same thing? The identical thing. In his massive book, The Resurrection of the Son of Man, he appeals to Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, as a prediction of the, quote, end of time, although he doesn't believe in an end of time. Resurrection ignores verse 7. So <clears throat> here's what we have. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, foretold the resurrection, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, the time of the kingdom when the righteous would shine forth, and all of that would be fulfilled when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus foretold the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, the coming of the Son of Man at the end of the age <clears throat> in that generation, meaning he was predicting, watch this, catch the power of this, in Matthew 24, 31, Jesus quoted from Isaiah 27, 13, a prophecy of the resurrection. All the ancient rabbis applied it that way. Most of your early church fathers applied it that way, for those of, who, of you who love the church fathers. So once again, running out of time, in Matthew 24, Jesus predicted the abomination of desolation, just like Daniel 12. Jesus predicted the great tribulation, just like Daniel 12 did. Jesus predicted the coming of the kingdom, just like Daniel chapter 12 did. Luke 12, verse 28 to 31. Jesus predicted the resurrection. Matthew 24, 31. He shall send forth his angels, with the sound of the great trumpet, they shall gather together the elect from the four winds. That is Isaiah 27, 13, which was a prediction of the resurrection, the prediction of Isaiah 26, 9 and following. Your dead shall rise. Daniel chapter 12 predicted the what? The fulfillment of all of those things when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. Jesus predicted all of those things at his coming in the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, ladies and gentlemen, since Jesus predicted the resurrection in Matthew 24, verse 31, and he put it in the first century generation, all millennialists and post-millennialists agreeing, how is that resurrection different from the resurrection of Matthew 25, 31 and following? You see the problem here? In order to divorce Matthew 25, 31 and following, you have to be able to prove it's a different resurrection from Matthew 24, 31, or you have to be able to prove that Matthew 24, 31 is not citing Isaiah 27, 13, or you have to prove 
that Isaiah 27, 13 is not a prediction of the resurrection. Can't do it. Now, since Isaiah 27, 13 predicted resurrection, oh, and out of the dust, Isaiah 26, 9 and following, you know, like Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Since Daniel and Isaiah were predictions of the resurrection at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, then how do you take the prophecy of the resurrection of Matthew tw chapter 25, 31 and following as anything other than the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70? Well, I'm out of time. Thanks again for joining me. Be sure to get May two book special save yourself almost 10 bucks <clears throat> you'll be glad you did hey i'll see you on the flip side